Welcome back to the Great Unsolved Podcast. I'm your host, Alexis, and this week we are going over the disappearance of Phoenix Colden. This is a crazy case and one of the only ones I believe that voluntary disappearance is a real theory. If you don't already, follow us on Twitter at Great Unsolved, on Instagram at Great Unsolved Pod. You can find a Facebook group and Facebook page by searching Great Unsolved on Facebook. You can also search at Alexis True Crime on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. You will find a lot of shorter videos of me going over cases. And on the YouTube, you will find this case as well as others that came out this month. So if you want to watch a video rather than listen to a podcast, go check that out. All right, welcome back. I think I have a little bit of a better setup, but I'm on the floor and my pets are here. So if you hear anything weird, that's probably what that is. Anyways, today we are going to go over the case of Phoenix Colden. She was just 23 years old when she went missing on December 18th of 2011 from Spanish Lake, Missouri slash kind of East St. Louis, Illinois. These were only 25 minutes apart, but they're in different states, which poses some difficulties later on. She was born in California as Phoenix Reeves, but then her family moved to Missouri and her mother met Lawrence Colden. Once Lawrence and Phoenix's mother got married, Lawrence adopted Phoenix and thus her name changed to Phoenix Colden. They were said to be a pretty tight-knit religious family and from all accounts, they seemed like a good family altogether. She was homeschooled, even though some of her friends later stated that she didn't really like it. She wanted to experience normal school. She wanted to have that social life, kind of that freedom, and she wanted to go to prom and all of those things. So when she went to college at 18, she went to University of Missouri-St. Louis, but she kind of had more of that social life and that freedom. Her parents co-signed an an apartment for her near the campus, And they were under the impression that it was going to be shared with a female roommate, but we would later find out it was actually shared with her boyfriend, who her parents did not know about. When she was younger, she was the junior fencing champion of St. Louis. She knew how to play the piano, the violin, it said many other instruments, and she was in the handbell choir at her church. So she was a high achiever. And her mother says that she always strived for perfection and just achieving things. It is reported that although Phoenix was kind of enrolled at University of Missouri, St. Louis, she did not enroll for credits the semester before she went missing. And she didn't enroll in credits the semester after she went missing which makes sense, she was missing, but generally you enroll in credits a few months prior. So it seems like she was not planning on going to college that year. And she did lie to some friends about this. It's unclear if she lied to her parents about this, but we know she told some friends over Thanksgiving that she was in classes and that they were going well, which we know to not be true. At the time of her disappearance, Phoenix had a secret second phone. Her first phone, she was on a family plan with her parents. So back at this time, you would get kind of a list of all the calls made and her parents would see that. So it's assumed she got a second phone to hide some people she was talking to from her parents. Or later we find out she kind of had two boyfriends So we think she was hiding her second boyfriend from her first boyfriend. But obviously the fact that she had two cell phones is important in this case and kind of concerning. It shows she was not being 100% truthful with people when she disappeared. So we have a pretty short timeline here, but let's get into it. On December 18th of 2011, which would be later known as the day she disappeared, Her and her mother went to church where Phoenix played in the handbell choir. It's important to mention that at the time of her disappearance, Phoenix had moved back in with her parents. 
because I believe they were paying for the apartment and they said it got too expensive and their home was pretty close to the college, so she moved back home. Later, a very close friend of hers would state that this is when things started going downhill. She started arguing with her parents. Her parents seemed kind of overbearing, but we'll get into that a little bit more later. This is all just things that people are saying. It's not confirmed, none of that. At 3 p.m., her dad, Lawrence Colden, states he saw Phoenix in the driveway in her car, a 1998 Chevy Blazer, and she was on her phone. He figured she just wanted some privacy on her phone, and that's why she was sitting out there. However, she did end up pulling out of the driveway, and generally she would say something to her parents. She would say, like, I'm going to a friend's house, I'm running to the store, something like that, but she did not. And the family would find this weird, but not super concerning at the time. They just believed she was running to a nearby store or something along those lines where it wouldn't take very long. At 5.27 p.m., a 911 call comes in stating there is an abandoned car on the corner of 9th Street and St. Clair Avenue in East St. Louis, Illinois. This turns out to be Phoenix's 1997 Chevy Blazer, and police go out to the scene. Originally, it was reported that the keys were in the ignition, the car was still on, and the driver's side door was open. But we later find out none of this was true. It just looked as if it had been parked there. Door was closed, keys were not in the ignition, car wasn't on, just parked in a traffic lane. This information was reported wrong for years and kind of made people speculate something more along the lines of like a random quick abduction that happened with the struggle. But when we realize the door wasn't left ajar, the car wasn't left on, just kind of seems like somebody parked it and got out like a normal person would. In between 5.35 p.m. and 6.23 p.m., the police arrive. It is one officer, I believe, and he runs the plates, finds out the car is not missing, it's just abandoned, so he ends up starting his quote-unquote investigation before having it towed to the impound lot. He would later state he found nothing weird about the car, he didn't see any signs of a struggle, any signs of somebody not willingly leaving. It was just parked there, and he had to take it to the impound lot. Because it did not come up as stolen, it was not reported to... Phoenix's parents, who were the owners of the car, who were on the title. All of that information was in the glove box, but it wasn't stolen, so it didn't really pop up on any databases, and they just were not notified. It was also in Illinois, not Missouri, where the family was, so although there's nothing that really says it, it could have been kind of miscommunication between systems as well. We end up seeing that a lot. We see that, you know, state to state, country to country, there's not a lot of communication between police force. Even in cities within the same state, it is difficult sometimes. On December 19th of 2011, Goldia, who is Phoenix's mother, is really worried. It's about 1.30 a.m. and she's getting concerned because Phoenix never reportedly stayed out past 1 a.m., so at this time, she calls the authorities to report Phoenix missing. I believe an officer came out to the house, and when Goldia and Lawrence said, yeah, she's 23 years old, the police were like, well, she's an adult, so she could have left if she wanted to. So really only been gone less than 12 hours. We can't really do anything. However, it's said that Goldia, she actually said it herself in a documentary from Oxygen that she said, I don't know what wolves raise you, but that's not how we do things here. She stated that she expected this police officer to file a missing persons report. The police officer ran the plates of the Chevy Blazer, and it did not come up in any databases because it wasn't stolen or anything like that. So he said, nothing came of it. We really can't do anything. In the following two weeks, Phoenix's parents made flyers. They contacted media, and they really tried the best they could to find any trace of Phoenix. But the media wasn't very receptive, and we see this in a lot of cases that don't involve white women, and it's the missing white women syndrome where 
if you have a white woman and an African-American woman who are both missing at the same time, even under similar circumstances, white woman's case is going to get a lot more media attention and her family believes this was the case in Phoenix's disappearance, which is unfortunate and shouldn't happen, but that kind of slowed this case down as well as the police not looking into it right away. On January 1st of 2012, about two weeks after Phoenix disappeared, a family friend said he saw the Colden's car in the East St. Louis impound lot. This was the first time that they were aware Phoenix's 1998 Chevy Blazer had been put in the impound lot. I would like to mention that East St. Louis is said to be a pretty bad area. It's a lot of abandoned buildings, has a lot of crime, and Phoenix's parents said she had no reason to go there. So they still believe to this day that Phoenix was not the one to drive the car to where it was found. Once the car was found, eventually police investigated it and they took pictures of everything, they cataloged everything, but they saw no signs of a struggle and they state there was no signs of a robbery. The parents ended up looking through a lot of abandoned buildings in East St. Louis and interviewing drug dealers and sex workers just to see if there was any sign or witness of Phoenix in the past few weeks. And it doesn't seem like this gave them any more information. A little while into the investigation, a video is found of Phoenix shortly before her disappearance. It is her in her car talking to the camera and she states how she's not happy, she wants to start over, she would like to start with a new me, meaning a new Phoenix. And she actually states she couldn't remember a time that she was happy. This obviously seems like someone going through some kind of depressive episode, something going wrong in their life, and kind of just wanting to start over. It was also found that she had two birth certificates, one as Phoenix Reeves that she was born as, and one as Phoenix Colden, which ends up making it a little easier to disappear. You already have documentation of another name, so you can kind of just go by that name at that point. There was a Phoenix Reeves found in Anchorage, Alaska, but it was concluded to not be the missing Phoenix. So back to the car. The police say when they investigated the car, they did not find a cell phone, but they were aware she had two cell phones. They also say they tracked her movements that day with the cell phone called GPS, but that is not public information at this time. They also say that Mike B, Phoenix's known or more known boyfriend, was very cooperative, and they concluded he had absolutely nothing to do with Phoenix's disappearance. They also stated that everything was still on the table. Voluntary disappearance, abduction, human trafficking, and even homicide. Supposedly, on these call records, you can see that the last call she got before she disappeared was from Mike B., her boyfriend. However, when he was questioned by police, he states he didn't remember what the call was about. Phoenix's parents say this is pretty hard to believe, and they believe he's lying. Apparently, after Phoenix went missing, he never called the phone again. So, many people speculate that this means he knew she wasn't going to answer, or she didn't have that phone. But once again, police say he was very cooperative and he was cleared of any wrongdoing in this case. So now we get to a little information about Phoenix that the friends put forward. They stated that Phoenix's parents were kind of overbearing and that they stated all of Phoenix's friends were a bad influence on her. This is where her best friend stated that when Phoenix moved back home, in 2011, Phoenix, mental state, and just her overall being started to go downhill. The friend states that Phoenix and her parents fought quite a bit, and this was probably due to her parents being strict, but Phoenix being 23, and just a disconnect there. About six-ish months before Phoenix's disappearance, she started to get paranoid. She thought people were following her. She thought something bad was going to happen to her. And supposedly, the mom told Phoenix and her friend that there was people watching them in the park, but the friend didn't really know what to make of any of this. Phoenix and her best friend, same one that was talking about her parents previously, 
got into an argument. This argument happened because Phoenix thought that her best friend was talking about her and her boyfriend to other people, to which her friend said, no, I would never do that. Like, why would you think that? And Phoenix got so angry about it, she pulled a knife on her friend, but supposedly kind of fizzled out from there and they made up. But after this, Phoenix did tell her friend that she was leaving. And the friend was like, where are you leaving? Where are you going? And she said, I'm just packing up and leaving. The friend states that at this time, it didn't seem like Phoenix was herself. It seemed like she was in a bad mental state and maybe having some kind of breakdown. So I mentioned that Mike B was her more known boyfriend. She also had a supposed boyfriend that will call because everybody else calls him, Cell Phone Mike. It seems from reports that Cell Phone Mike was a little bit more sketchy and people really didn't know him, even Phoenix's closest friends. It was concluded that her second cell phone was to hide cell phone Mike from Mike B. It was alleged that he had some acts of violence against his ex-girlfriend, and in the documentary from Oxygen, the journalist and the investigator do talk to cell phone Mike's ex-girlfriend, and she states he was physically, mentally, and emotionally abusive. They started talking, and then they got into a 1.5-year relationship, and he became possessive and angry and then began abusing her. Apparently at this time, he was extensively researching missing persons cases, some missing persons, missing women from Chicago area, and then Phoenix. And she asked him about it and he admitted that him and Phoenix had had sex, but when she got kind of mad about it, he asked, why are you mad about somebody who's dead? So he insinuated she was dead, but we don't know if it was more of a speculation or if he actually knew what happened to her. In 2014, a friend of the Coldens states she was on a plane and she saw Phoenix, at least someone who looked identical to Phoenix. When she called Phoenix's name, this woman reacted. However, she did not talk to her and this woman was with several other women and two large men who did not react to this woman saying her name. So we have three basic theories here. One, she voluntarily left. Two, she was abducted and put into human trafficking. And three, she was abducted and murdered. The video she took shortly before her disappearance is her saying she wanted to start over and she was never happy, which lends itself to someone starting a new life. It said her parents were strict, maybe a little overbearing, and she wanted more freedom. So this could have caused her to leave as well. There was no sign of struggle in the car that police could find, which kind of counts out the idea of her being abducted, at least abducted from the car. It's thought that she voluntarily left the car. From the best friend, we know that she was supposedly fighting with her parents and thought people were following her, which are two reasons to just kind of disappear. In the theory of abduction and human trafficking, we know East St. Louis is not a good place. There's a lot of crime and there's a highway right there that is notorious for human trafficking. So it is very plausible that she could have been picked up either after leaving her car or been lured out of her car. She was paranoid and maybe not in the best mental state at the time she disappeared, which for human traffickers makes her easier to prey on and take. Since it seems like Phoenix had some secrets from her family and her friends, there's the possibility that she could have been hanging out with some pretty sketchy people, and these people could have gotten her into trouble. Lastly, we have the idea of abduction and murder. Once again, East St. Louis, lots of crime. There has been no real confirmed sighting of Phoenix since she disappeared, so kind of makes it less likely she is out there somewhere. Cell phone Mike's ex states that he was violent and I guess you could say kind of manipulative if he was emotionally and mentally abusive, which could lend itself to hurting Phoenix as well. That's all I have for the case of Phoenix Colden, or also known as Phoenix Reeves. It's not a super old case, it's 12 years old. We've looked at much older cases that have been solved. So there's a possibility it could be solved. Generally, I'm not in the boat of this is a voluntary disappearance, but for this case, I think I could see it. Everything I've seen on this case 
states she was not happy with her life and she wanted freedom, which could really push someone to just disappear and start a new life. Thank you for going over the case of missing Phoenix Colden with me. This is one of the cases I believe voluntary disappearance could really be a theory, but we don't know as of now. Hopefully at some point we will find out and her family will have peace. If you don't already, follow us at Great Unsolved on Twitter, at Great Unsolved Pod on Instagram. Join our Facebook group and like our Facebook page by searching Great Unsolved on Facebook. You can also search at Alexis True Crime on TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook. On TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook, you will find a bunch of shorter videos of me talking about cases. There are a ton on there. And on YouTube, you will find these full-length episodes as videos as well. (laughs) 